gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for coming back despite the weather. This is um, obviously our last uh, formal meeting of the day. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Vasu Reddy, uh, who is Professor of Developmental and Cultural Psychology at the University of Portsmouth and uh, Director of the Centre for Situated Action and Communication there. Uh, and um, she is uh, well known in, in that field and, uh, and well known also for a, a book recently published by Harvard Press, Harvard University Press, How Infants Know Minds, obviously a topic absolutely essential to our discussions uh, during this conference. So I, I now invite her to speak to you from the podium. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Right. Um, I'm kind of, I was trying to, I'm not, a, I'm not by nature a very organized person, so I kind of forced myself to try and be organized. That's kind of the organization of the talk today. I'm going to be talking about the need for different conceptions of mind, probably to an audience like this. I don't need to go to town on that, but I think it is probably important to um, dwell on how one needs to change these conceptions a little bit. Um, the, cent the main part of the talk is about the centrality of engagement for awareness of mind, and I'm going to be talking about two different aspects of what have been common categories of mind uh, in the developmental literature. I'm not particularly attached to these labels, so this is, this is an aside to Peter Hobson saying, I use the term attention because it's commonly understood. I've tried using the term attending and attentional engagements, etc. It doesn't give the message as, clear, as simply as does the term intention. So the terms in that respect are not, for me, crucial. Something like attentionality, how do we get there? Something like understanding awareness of intentional action, how do we get there? So that's going to be the bulk of the talk. And I'm going to kind of end up, end with something, um, well, talking about the cultural constitution of mind, but using a definition of culture which is not the, a top-down imposed culture as something that comes in from outside. Okay, so talking about conceptions of mind. Um, Okay, so I'm going to be a little bit briefer than I normally would on this one. There are hundreds of different definitions. Most of you, some of you are philosophers of mind, and I don't need to kind of go into these different definitions. There are, other people have talked a little bit in this conference, but you probably have been aware from other sources. There are different um, routes or processes to gaining awareness of mind, which are common in the literature. The most common ones are the theory theory, you think about them, you theorize them, you, you infer things and you, you use some kind of causal analysis to understand it. Um, or simulation theory, you kind of feel it in yourself in one, some implicit way or some explicit way. So no problem for any of us that all of these different processes can simultaneously exist. However, what most of these processes, um, most of these approaches and processes omit is a kind of feeling that minds are felt, that minds aren't just sitting there to be understood in one way or another. You actually feel them, not, your, not just your own mind, but other people's minds are felt. They're not just imagined, they're not just conceived or theorized, and they're not essentially opaque. So this is kind of something that, that is common, has been common to quite a lot of the short talks as well that I've heard today. But for me, within developmental psychology, it's been a bit of a, it's been a, bit of a puzzle. I mean, I, I'm not a philosopher. Um, um, I, came to developmental psych I came to philosophy kind of through necessity of having to deal with, this, with these ideas that when people keep telling you that you can't talk about mind when you talk about these things, that's just behavior and that's just um, some kind of physical movement. That's mere physicality. That's not mentality. That's not psychological. That's physical. So you can't, as a developmental psychologist, you can't do a good job. You can't even do a job unless you actually deal with what it is that you're dealing with. So, okay. So I kind of delved in very patchily into bits of philosophy. And it, was, it has been, continues to be really puzzling. No self-respecting psychologist would accept a mind-body dualism. You simply wouldn't go there. Um, most self-respecting psychologists accept one of the implications of a, mind, of a straight Cartesian mind-body dualism, which is a mind-behavior dualism. So straight from day one in introductory classes in psychology, you are taught when you observe behavior, when you observe things, don't think you know the meaning. You cannot see the meaning. You cannot even 
uh, assume that you can in some way know the meaning, switch off your humanity, look at the physical movement, describe the behavioral, stop there. This is lessons that we, we've had to learn. And it is absolute, well, it's like a Bible, but it's a kind of a nonsense Bible in a way. It's nonsense for a number of reasons. One is this logical puzzle. Why do we still hang on to this if there is really no um, ex, uh, res extensor, res thingamy difference? Why do we actually hang on to the implication that one is of a different kind of element than the other? And one is visible and one is completely invisible. They're two separate things. It's also the kind of um, underpinning, this divide between mind and behavior is the underpinning of, within the tradition of psychology, what is underpinned, both cognitivism, sorry, both behaviorism and cognitivism, which came after, underpinned it in this way. Both of them have assumed, have assumed, had assumed, have assumed the separateness of these two things. There's mind and then there's behavior. You can't, there's no necessary relation between them and you can't assume that there is. You can't draw conclusions from one to the other. You have to kind of guess. Behaviorism dealt with it by saying, can't see it, don't want it, don't want to know it. Cognitivism dealt with it by saying the only thing we really want to know is the stuff that goes on inside which we can't see. It doesn't matter about behavior. But both of them assume this split. It's also an empirical trap, an empirical trap in the sense that as soon as you start assuming that if you're talking about social cognition, if you're talking about understanding other people, and you're saying that you actually, you draw a line where you can't understand anything mental, psychological, the thing that makes persons persons, until you are capable of some kind of a complex inferential capacity. So you, ha you have to have a different kind of architecture in place before, you can, before you, we can say that you understand minds or you can get to an awareness of minds. Okay, you can do that. If you do do that, what you're ruling out is all the processes, all the development, all the development that goes up towards that awareness. Right? You're actually ruling out as relevant phenomena how that capacity comes into being. So whatever you however you define it, however you choose to define it, you've got a kind of a trap there. Um, so it's, you, it has led, it's not just a theoretical problem, it's led in practice to the develop, to the neglect of early phenomena because they don't fit the rules, right? It's the neglect, it's led to a neglect of the practice of these very understandings of mind, these intermental entanglements, if you like, that could explain how infants get to it. And it's led to a very straight um, habit of top-down predictions where conceptual developments are supposed to lead to action. And time and time again, if you take the theory of mind and its various predictions over the last 20 years, time and time again, it's made predictions that until you have X, until you pass X test, you can't have Y action, which have been kind of wrong, which have been proven wrong. And time and time again, the concepts change. Oh, it's not X, but it's X minus one, and then it's X minus two, leading to, and so on and so forth. So I don't, I don't it's kind of, it kind of seems a little bit implausible, to be honest. Okay, um, let's go on to the centrality of engagement, right? This is the, sort of the bulk of the talk that I'm going to do. So I'm, I'm not looking at engagement as an independent variable, which you can control in an experiment by varying the amount of interaction or by doing an on switch and an off switch um, as something that influences the stuff that's going on. It's very, engagement, I, I see engagement very much as, a, as emotional engagement. And it is a constituting process in the phenomenon. It's not something that sits outside and points with arrows coming into that knowledge. Okay, it's a difficult term. I mean, I don't think any of us really have a full handle on how to handle this term or to how to handle the implications empirically, but I, that's kind of how I'm approaching it. You have different forms and intensities of engagement. You have direct engagement in the second person, as it were, um, which is, again, people have been talking about it. Monica Dulstein spoke about it today, and um, I think Vivian spoke about it a little bit, which where the call upon um, the you, that is the person that is addressed as a you, the call upon the you, the effect on the you, the response that is required of you, pulled out of you by the person addressing you is most vivid, most intense, probably most rich. This is not to say that you can't engage emotionally with things outside. It is, you know, 
I'm a crier at movies, and I know how real that feels. I'm not crying for something that is just fictional. I'm crying for the very real thing that is happening on a screen. However, this is a later event, right? I mean, in developmentally, I think this is something that comes after these, most, uh, these early direct engagements. In, in everyday life, our most vivid engagements are the direct ones where people address us. And it's the kind of thing that is people addressing you, not just verbally, but even just physically with their bodies, is something that you can't do nothing about. If I approach you with a fist, right, kind of looking threateningly, you will not do nothing. I mean, you cannot but respond. If I approach you with a request for something, you could ignore it, but your whole body is probably tensing in response to the wanting to ignore my request for whatever it is. You can't do nothing in relation to it. So there's a kind of a, you are placed in a very funny situation. You are placed in a situation of having to literally either do something or do nothing, but you have to do the nothing or the something. Um, I've been arguing that this allows felt response in infants to specific aspects of mind, and this is exactly what allows the development of a mutuality of expanding action, response, and exploration. So if basically my point is that if infants didn't get this, if infants didn't get the experience of people addressing them as a you, the kind of development that they have, the kind of experience of minds that they have, and therefore the kinds of eventually conceptions of mind they have would be quite different, would have to be quite different. Um, so different engagements lead to different conceptualizations of mind. And this is not something that is limited to infancy. I think it is as pertinent to us now. So give us two years in a prison or give us two years in an awful place to work. And I think our conceptions of people and minds are going to be somewhat dodgy and different. Okay, so let's talk about these two things that I want to talk about. How do infants get to um, some kind of awareness of attention? When do they get there and how do they get there? This is the first thing. The second thing I was going to talk about was intentional action. Okay, the standard views about how and when we understand attention, or whatever it is that we want to call it, attentional, the attentional qualities of engagement, if you like, or attentional engagements. The standard view is that attention is discovered at somewhere around 9 to 12 months, 9 to 11 months, let's say. It's kind of vague, depending on what particular criterion you use. How do you know it's discovered? It's discovered, this is according to the standard theory, it's discovered when, well, you have evidence that it is discovered when infants start engaging triadically. Peter's spoken about it. The phenomenon itself was first identified, well, probably first identified by Elizabeth Bates in the 1970s. It's been picked up by... A lot of people, Colwyn Trevathan speaks about secondary intersubjectivity and so on. So the phenomenon is a triadicness. I can point to you and say, give me your pen. I can point to that and say, look at that. I'm doing a triadic engagement. The reason I'm doing a triadic engagement could be different things. But what I'm doing is either using you to get that or using that to get you, etc. Different motivations, but it's a triadic. Why is this important? Well, it's traditionally it's been taken as important because it's been argued that until you have, you as a scientist, have evidence that the infant can kind of look at your gaze direction and um, look there and look back, you don't have evidence that the infant thinks that there's something inside you that is looking there. So it's kind of like, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, the reason for relying on it was not a theoretical reason you cannot be aware of attention before, but this is clear evidence. This we can test in experimental situations, right? Because you've kind of got the infant to, to extend the attentionality somewhere else or vice versa. But what happens, um, the theories that then grew up to explain this new interesting live phenomenon were basically saying, until that happens, it's not now we have evidence of clear infants conscious of something in you looking at outside, but now we have the first awareness of attention, which is kind of crazy, because there's a, there's a whole at least nine months worth of entanglement with other people's attentionality. What is going on? It can't be nothing. So when you have people, including, well, when you have people uh, talking about the discovery of attention at this sort of age, you have to ask, is this actually valid? When you have people um, ident equating joint attention, for instance, which is a kind of a problem that I have, equating joint attention with awareness of attention, 
Joint attention is usually the word term used to describe the triadic bit. Equating joint attention with any awareness of attention, you think, wait a minute. It's not the same thing. I mean, it depends if you change the meaning of the term, that's fine, but okay. Um, how is it discovered at nine or 10 months? By, according to these theories, conceptual representation. You have a click, you, the infant, have a click thinking, that's not just mum and her head moving this way and that way, that's mum with a thought bubble inside her which is attention which is capable of being directed elsewhere. It really, you have to represent that somebody else is representing something in order to be able to do so. That's the kind of, that's the, that's the argument. The alternative, which you might want to call ET if you're feeling particularly homesick, or engagement theory, um, I would argue, su suggests that attention, you're aware of attention from very shortly after birth in some of the meanings which we understand to mean attention and attentionality. Um, it begins with mutual attention and it grows in meaning and scope. Okay, how does it, how does all this happen? Well, it happens in practice through attentional engagements and it happens as a process of elaboration and differentiation rather than as a process of conceptual representation and discovery. Um, this is, it's also because I'm in love with him, Merleau-Ponty, but it's also because I have to have something philosophical in a philosopher's conference. But I love this quote of Merleau-Ponty's. I discover vision not as a thinking about seeing, to use Descartes' expression, but as a gaze at grips with a visible world. That's why, for me, there can be another's gaze. But my argument is that attention can be experienced. It comes and hits you as well as observed and must be experienced for what we understand as a typically developing awareness of attention. So my argument is a slight twist to the Merleau-Ponty quote. I discovered vision not as a thinking about seeing, but as a gaze that grips with me. And that is why, for me, there can be another's gaze or another's vision. Um, okay, so attention to self. Don't bother with the detail of this. There's a ton of literature. Attention to self does things to your brain. People call you, call your name, your brain goes a bit bananas. It happens, it's even, even been shown uh, it, through EEG in four, five month old infants, not with name call, well, sort of with name calling, also with gaze. Um, also in neonates, if you look at newborn infants, two to five days old, so they have got a little bit of experience of people looking at them. Um, you look, they, you show them the most boring black and white photographs of a face, just a face, looking at them, or with the eyes going sideways looking, I mean, it's bizarre stuff, could be that's why, but they prefer the eyes looking straight forward, right? And not just that, you, you show them, you give them mutual gaze in newborns before you look away. Well, they don't follow gaze, but their, their saccades, um, the eye movements immediately after are very much more in the direction, in the correct direction than if you didn't give them mutual gaze before. So there's something that pulls you, there's something that does something to you, to, be put, to put it very crude. It, and it leads not just to learning, because you learn things better when people look at you before. Ton of evidence, right? Not just that, but it leads to different emotional reactions. As early as two and three months, people look at you, you smile. People look at you, you cry. If you, especially if you can't switch your attention away, people look at you, you can sometimes be horribly indifferent, as um, Eleanor was saying, much to the distress of the observer who kind of said, look at me, smile at me. But people look at you and you can also be coy. This is all the kind of range of emotional uh, reactions, responses to people looking at you in the normal case that you can find in us and you can find also in infants. Okay, here's an example of um, a two and a half month old looking at herself in the mirror. I don't know whether you can see this. Can you see it? It's kind of too bright, isn't it? I don't, I think I asked if they could just pull those blinds, but um, you know how to do it. <laughs> this is that one as well. Wonderful. Okay. Um, this is a two and a half month old. Her mother is carrying her. What you see here is the reflection in the mirror. They are actually standing here. When the baby's eyes kind of come about there, that's when her gaze meets herself, okay? Now, I use this as an example, not because it is particularly important that she's looking at herself. It could be just any person, 
right? That's not the important thing here. It's not important that she's looking at herself for the purpose of the argument I want to make. Um, is she's been looking at herself and recognizing her face, because it's this friend in the mirror, for a few couple of weeks now. And this is the kind of reaction that you get, which in the traditional scheme of things, you're not supposed to be able to get coyness before about 12, 18 months of age. Oops. Okay, so, um, right, I'm not going to talk about this. So what my argument is, that I, remember I told you about the awareness of attention isn't discovered at some point in time like here, the awareness of attention expands. And it expands in a number of different ways. One of the ways in which it expands, I think, is that the infant starts to become aware of other people's attention, not just simply as being directed to me, as, as grabbing me, but other people's attention as kind of moving outward from me a little bit. So things like, forget that middle one, but look at self-acts. So one of the kind of interesting things that you get somewhere around, starting around seven or eight months of age, is infants becoming aware, not just that you're looking at me, praising, praising me, laughing at me, etc., but that you are attending in some particular way, usually positively, to the things that I do, to the acts that I do, okay? And you start getting this kind of flourishing of mischief, which can, be, which can be absolutely wonderful. So you start getting things like clowning and teasing and showing off. And you, you get amazing things like children, babies. I had an example of a, of a seven-month-old sitting in a supermarket trolley who had developed a very, very kind of nasty shriek. And the thing is, the parents would turn around in alarm, thinking, oh my God, she's fallen off the trolley, and of course she's sitting there kind of grinning. You get, you get a range of things. You, you really get a huge range of things that infants have discovered of the things that they do that r cause other people to re respond with some kind of um, particular attentional response. Now, the, the clever thing here... Okay, that's fine. Um, let me just show you an example of, um, of clowning. Okay, this is an eight-month-old. Are you dancing? No. Okay, so this is kind of like, uh, kind of the first time that this particular head shaking, which is another very common way that infants clown, another, very, another common one is uh, fake coughing. Things that stick out, things that are absurd, things that you walk in a funny way or make funny expressions, etc., cetera, um, which infants seize on response, link it to their action, and repeat until they really are boring, okay? And then they kind of die out. And there are different styles of individual responding in that way. Typically developing infants at about, by about eight months. Forget this column on showing off. That kind of um, tends not to vary very much in an increasing fashion, but just forget that. If you just look at this column, between eight, 11, and 14 months, there are about three quarters of infants already at eight months doing fairly simple things like splashing heavily in the bath, but then becoming more complex as they get older um, in order to re-elicit laughter from others, right? things that they know have produced laughter and re-elicited. We did a study with um, children, preschool children with autism and um, with Downs as well, and very predictably, uh, it, both showing off clowning and, as I'll talk about it later, teasing were very uh, were infrequent. And when they did occur, they tended to be done, as the parents described it, rather formulaically. So, um, so you'd get the same kinds of things repeated on again, on and on again, which was not the case with the children with Downs and was not the case in typically developing children of that sort of age. I'm getting a kind of a buzz feedback here with sound. I don't know whether you are. If you want me to do anything like turn my sound down, 
tell me. I'm speaking to the guys outside, but you may not hear me. They may not hear me, but anyway, all right. Okay, so we've gotten down there. As you get down older, you do get the th stuff about the things in space, the triadic stuff we already know. You also get, somewhere in the second year, um, infants doing things like keeping favorite, keeping stories, if you like. When mummy comes home, milk bottle, which broke during the day, but which mummy hadn't seen. Or when mummy comes home, which happened to me once, a carefully preserved pot of we, potty of we, kept there all day thinking, show mummy, right? <laughs> now, the point, the connection here is that the infant is able to some, is able to actually grasp that mum has this attentional capacity, even though she's not here, and over a period of time. So it's kind of, a, it's kind of an expansion of what attention can do, which is pretty remarkable for the, uh, uh, over the, in the second year. What's happening there, though, is that the scope of attention is widening. Okay, I'm not going to talk about problems in autism with all of this because um, we've, had, we've had Peter talk about them. I'm not going to go there for now. Um, let's move to the next one, which is awareness of intentional action. Right? The standard conceptual views have changed over time quite considerably. So about, in about the late 80s, early 90s, we had... Um, the view that your children couldn't understand intentions until somewhere around four years of age. And the argument there was that to understand intention, you had to understand the plan for an action as separate from the, from the performance of the action. You had to be able to separate those two things. And you couldn't do it. You couldn't understand the intentions of incomplete actions. You couldn't do it until about the age of four, at around the same time as you started to apparently, understand false belief. So intentions and beliefs were, at that, at that point in time, thought to be kind of similar in, in their demands, in their complexity and demands. So you had tests like cartoon drawings of children um, leaping into swimming pools, right? Just a simple cartoon drawing of children le leaping there or a cartoon drawing of a child about to leap into the swimming pool or a cartoon drawing of a child on the swing, swinging, and another drawing of a child running to the swing. And the child was asked questions like, which of these children, which one, is gonna swing or wants to swing? Which one wants to swim? And, okay. Three-year-old children failed verbally to distinguish them. Now, there's all sorts of problems with them, and very clearly there could be a big language factor in, in younger children not being able to pass those tests. But another way of challenging this idea that children can't, young infants and young children can't understand incomplete actions is looking at when children actually try to violate, themselves try to violate your action. I don't know how many of you remember having kids or being around kids, but kids can be remarkable teasers. And it's actually, if you just pay attention to them, it's, it's actually wonderful. What they, what they tend to do is usually with newly developed understandings or newly developed <laughs> skills they start to muck about with them. So let's say I've just learned to walk, right? So for two weeks, everybody's kind of really happy and I'm, you know, I do it all straight. And then I start to walk in a funny kind of way. I play around with the edges, okay? I can do that alone or I can do that in interaction. And what's really interesting is that you start getting infants mucking about with, teasing others with interpersonal understandings. So one of the, um, the, the, the thing that made me see it in the first instance was with giving. Now kids start to learn to be able to give somewhere around, let's say nine, 10 months. It varies between infants. What they do before that is they tend to sign up, hold things out and then take it back, but they're not, it's like they, it's like they kind of don't know what to do with it. You don't know whether they're showing it to you or giving it to you or what, okay? Then they hold things out very much more clearly, and it looks like they want to give it to you, but they can't let go. <laughs> I don't actually understand. I don't, know, I don't quite know what's going on there. It really does need study. They say, it's almost like they want to do it, but they can't let go. And then they let go at some point within a few weeks or days or whenever it happens. And when they let go, and then you take it and you encourage it because you're terribly thrilled, because it's a phenomenal, um, it's a phenomenal achievement, really. This happens long before pointing. If you're talking about nine months, pointing is somewhere around 11, 11 months-ish that you might, you might get pointing, right? Um, 
it's kind of a really sort of a good feeling, this. And so parents make a, make a meal of it. And then you start getting about 50% of kids before, before they are one year old, parents respond that they start to tease with it. Not, not all kids do it, but they start to tease with it. So you kind of get an offer, and then you kind of get a withdrawal. And the whole point is, I know what you're going to do. That is, you want me to give it. You're going to reach out and get me to give it. And I'm not going to do it. So I hold it out to you. You reach out innocently, very often. And then I pull it back and I grin. Now, this can turn into games. Once it turns into a game, the meaning of this action changes. But um, in the initial instance, in the first few times when this is occurring, it's really <laughs> remarkable. And you get, especially when it's kind of a voluntarily you know, initiate, initiated holding out. OK. Again, in typically developing infants, about half of eight-month-olds were reported to do it. I mean, reported to do it in the sense that we didn't just ask parents whether they did children teased or not. We actually got the examples, and we evaluated them. Um, by the end of the first year, almost all of them were doing it. And again, very low in children with ASD, much higher in children with Down syndrome. OK, let's take another view of intentional action, the Tomasello kind of view. The argument there is that simple intentions, right? I look at you, I can see that you're intending to reach for that pen, something like Just a simple intention. I am the knower, and I know that there's a thought bubble in your head saying intending to do X. These don't come on stream until about 9 or 11 months of age, according to Thomas L. Lowe. But then you have more complex intentions. You have communicative intentions, which are, I, let's say you tell me, don't talk so loudly. Or, yeah, don't talk so loudly. And um, I, in order to need, understand your intention, I need to get to your thought bubble, right, your intention, that I intend, that I should intend to do X. It's kind of, in one particular paper of his, he argues this, and it's kind of really painted as a very complex picture. Now, OK, so we decided to do the study looking at the origins of compliance, i.e. compliant responses to other people's directives, right? When do infants actually start to listen, and how do they do it? What's the process of emergence? It's ridiculous. We know it kind of begins around 9, 10 months. Actually, not as, not as late as you would expect from that theory, but we don't know how it happened. So we started to look at it. I wanted to look for about nine months, waste of energy, waste of resources to do the study, longitudinal, painful observational work too early. A colleague of mine said, no, 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 let's look earlier because then we can get a baseline before you get directives and before you get compliance, fine. So we start the, start the study at six and a half months, go on longitudinally at about 12 and a half months, and uh, from six and a half months, it's a cross-cultural study. So we looked, in, looked at a sample in India and at a sample in Portsmouth, India, because it was convenient and because Indians do a lot of directing, um, and Portsmouth because it was convenient, because I worked there. And it was ridiculous, but in all the families, there was directives even from six and a half months, right? Now, actually, when you think about it, if you look at videotapes of two-month-olds and three-month-olds interacting with their mothers, the directives themselves, the mothers are going on with, give us another smile, say hi to daddy, wave your leg now. There's actually, to be honest, no shortage of directives. It shouldn't have surprised me, but it did. What was, what was surprising was the way in which the mothers were kind of drawing the infants in to the directive by repeating them so often they're often the same one until something happened, and, and um, kind of drawing the infant into different kinds of directives. In, in the space of one hour, we got, um, again, they were much higher in India, but I'll I just show you the figures here. If you look at these two graphs, just look at the black line, okay? And this is frequencies, mean frequency per hour, and that, it says 10 per hour, 20 per hour, and so on and so forth, right? Um, the black line is the parents' directives. And um, this is in Portsmouth, that's in Hyderabad in India, and the broken line is actually the number of first-time compliances by the, by the infants, 
Okay? So we weren't looking sort of complex, I understand what you mean and I'm going to do it. We were looking for, within a reasonable space of time, did the infant actually do it? The first, the, to the first directive. And what you can see, even at six and a half months, although it's low in Portsmouth, there, was a, there were a reasonable number. This is mean across um, the sample. There was a reasonable number of compliances, and it continued. What, did ha what was really interesting was that although you got this very large, you got this increase in the directive frequency over the course of the first year, you didn't get an, inc and you got an increase in the frequency of compliant responses. You didn't get an increase in the percentage. So basically the, the message is, you can be as directive or non-directive as you like. You will get more instances of the thing that you want. You won't increase, if you like, compliantness in your kid. You won't get a percentage increase. Now, why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting for this reason. I didn't think it would be this. I didn't think parents did any kind of training for, for eliciting compliance. I think I'd been too far from my parenthood, of, of uh, my infant parenthood, as it were. I, didn't th I thought babies aren't like dogs and cats. They don't need to be rewarded. They don't need to be trained. They, I actually thought they kind of switched into understanding. And they kind of don't. The understanding is gradual. There, isn't, there aren't sharp, dramatic differences in I understand that you want me to do X. What there is, is, particular, is the learning of very specific kinds of um, commands within specific situations. Right? So it is, it's, not, it's not simply a matter of association. It's a question of learning what is expected in this situation. Oh, there's that command, stand, and I'll stand. Right? It's, the parents are training through a process of repetition and enormous frequency of directives, drawing the infants into thinking, right, this is what I have to do, and this is um, not just the kinds of things I have to do, but I kind of am being invited to do things by the parents. So it's invited into participation as well as what they're participating in. <coughs> Okay, let me just give you some examples of the, I should have actually shown you this first. This is uh, Jack. Go kick it, kick the ball, Jack, kick the ball. <coughs> Jack, good boy. Okay, go again. Good. So you've got these kind of almost accidental um, occasions where compliance occurs, but you did get you do get these flicks of looking up at the face when they do it, and then over the course of weeks, days, even these things actually are, uh, are emerging as understanding of what the mother wants me to do. Here's one in India. Sit, sit, she says. I mean, these could be daft skills for, um, um, okay, right. These could be kind of daft routines which were probably exaggerated for the sake of the observer because they're kind of trying to show off. So the frequencies are probably a little bit higher than you would normally get in everyday life, but they're there. And the style of the parents responding and ways of drawing the kids in isn't an exaggeration. That's the kind of the ways in which they, they are basically training the kids without without feeding them doggy little bits. So what does this say about um, understanding intentions? Emerging, I think the parents respond, parents' directives are creating like a response space for infants. It's like there's many different examples of how parents, it's this thing about if I'm telling you to do something, like you can't do nothing, right? You're being invited into this kind of action space and you kind, of, you kind of get drawn in not only to learning the things you have to do, but into learning that you have to do them. That there is the possibility of, of, of complying with other people's directives. And it's the repetition that is the key here. Okay, the last bit, and this is the kind of last sort of phenomenon I want to deal with. I'm not sure um, how you're doing with time. Most recently, intentional action um, and understanding of the goal-directedness of intentional action has been shown by Amanda Woodward to even five-month-old infants can tell the difference when I keep reaching for a teddy bear here, right, and then the screen changes on a monitor and the infant is shown me reaching for a ball here rather than the teddy bear which is over there. 
They don't look so surprised when I reach for the teddy bear with a new action. They do look surprised when I do the same action but reach for a different object. It's like they kind of they get the goal directedness of actions, right? This is infants sitting in front of monitors and doing habituation studies. Now, like as with attention, most research with, with infants' understanding of other people's intentional actions doesn't look at intentional actions directed towards them. Most research with attention or with intentional actions looks at attention or inten intentional actions directed somewhere else and gets the infant to be an observer of these phenomena and says, okay, when do you make discriminating responses? When do you respond appropriately? And how do you show that you understand it? But if you look at infants from the moment they are born, they're poked and prodded and pulled and, and have horrible things done up to them. They have stuff, cotton swabs stuck up their noses. And the experience of hands coming towards them, the experience of people approaching them, the experience of being done unto, right, is enormous towards them. It's much richer than intentional actions directed towards objects. We tend not to look at that. So I looked at it, and um, one of the things that I have been in, I was interested in for a long time um, because nobody had done it, was children's responses to being picked up. Yeah? So if I come to pick you up, one of the things, I mean, I kind of noticed this, and other people have talked about it in the, anecdotally in the literature. You pick a baby up off a car seat, and you actually can feel the back already arched. Right? You're not actually doing it. That's kind of cute. You know? So what, how do you measure it? Because you can't see it. So then we discovered this new technological, I've become in my old age a technological um, geek, really. This new technology we discovered was pressure mats. Okay? So you lie these, lay these pressure mats on, and um, it's got like a thousand centers in a, sensors in a simple plastic mat. You put the baby on its back, and surely you can see the back arching. You can see this and that. It wasn't as simple as that. But anyway, so having got that technology, we decided to do the study. And um, what would you, the back arching wasn't very clear, right, for a number of different reasons. But we got, a, we got kind of um, arm and leg and head adjustments before the mother's arms even reached the baby, which we really didn't expect. I was expecting adjustments after contact, right, and that's why the pressure mats were useful. Um, I don't know whether, in, yeah, well, I don't know, you could be old enough to, when, when I was young, a student and in Edinburgh, and um, there was, it was a lot of activism in Scotland in those days, and I, I still remember this. If you want to avoid being, if you're in a riot, in a demonstration, well, I never actually was, but I kind of like the idea of being. If you're in a demonstration and you want to avoid being arrested by the police, right, because they come and carry you, right, the thing to do is to let your body go completely limp. Okay, um, rather than go, rather than hold yourself stiff, because then they then they find it real easy. So what these babies were doing, one of the things they were doing, was sticking their legs out as the mother's arms approach, sticking their legs out, stiffening them, and slightly raised off the mat. Okay, or tucking their legs up into a ball. Not all of them did it, but the majority at three months were doing it, and. The, all of them at two months were doing it, but not in a particularly sensible time order. Um, the other thing that they were doing, which I really didn't expect, was opening their arms out. Okay? I didn't think you'd get, you got that until about six months. But I'm going to skip all the guff and just show you the videos. These are three clips of three-month-olds. Um, what we did for the analysis was divide it into three periods of chat, approach, and after contact, where the arms contact. Okay, there you just see the arms and you see a little bit of chin rising, okay, Before, during the approach. This one does her legs. Watch her legs. And the stiffening of the neck. Okay. Okay. So what we found was that if you look at these three periods of chat, approach, and contact, the duration and, in fact, the incidence, how many kids did it and didn't do it, 
um, in about 18 three-month-olds was um, increasing significantly, right? I mean, it was like a very dramatic thing. What also happened was the amount of thrashing, the kind of excited thrashing, um, I don't have it on a, on a map here, but um, decreased again over the three phases. Um, we also analyzed the math data. Now, this is kind of complicated. It's something called a cross-recurrence analysis. Basically, you um, correlate each data point with itself, okay? It doesn't matter about the, the maths of it, but what you've got here is on a diagonal is time. And this is about one and a half seconds during chat, during approach, and during contract, just before, during, and after in each particular case. And if you've got lots of black blobs, it's like there's a pattern. If you've got lots of um, um, breaking up, if you've got white noise, there's basically no pattern. And the Okay, this is, going to, this is kind of complicated to understand. It took me a long time. During chat, there's kind of patterns all over the place. There isn't a nice cluster of little black squares along the time diagonal. During approach, with approach being in the middle here, there's one particular pattern of bodily stability followed very rapidly by a shift to a different pattern. And during contact, the same sort of thing is happening, one particular stability but it's shifting a little bit later. Now, um, we also found this in two-month-olds and four-month-olds, but with two-month-olds, the, the differentiation between the phases was not so clear. They still did do it. They still, you still got it, but it was not systematic at the group level. Here is a two-month-old who did show it very clearly. Okay, it doesn't make sense, right? I, well, I don't know. To me, it doesn't make sense. I don't. I. I, I think what really um, freaks me is that I never saw it, and I thought I was a good observer. So, if you look at the development over two, three, and four months, you've got the same thing: decreasing motor thrashing, general movements, at all ages, and increasing over the three phases increasing specific adjustments, right? Increasing duration of specific adjustments at all three ages. What's happening by four months is that they don't do it too early. They wait a bit until it's quite late, which is sensible. So anticipatory adjustments to being picked up suggest that infant's awareness of actions directed to the self may occur earlier than, those, than of those directed elsewhere, and actually thus enable infants' active participation in joint actions from early in life. So there's things going on there that the practice of which is your route to actually understanding more complexly and more subtly what these intentional actions are all about. Um, one of the things that we found in, in these, it's not until about four months that infants start looking at the hands of the mother. It actually distracts them. It disrupts the movement. Now, you, my... my um, my interpretation of that is that there is a growing interest in hand somewhere around three or four months, and that's what the infants are actually kind of watching that, and they forgot to, forget to respond for two reasons. They're interested in that, and it's not a big deal anymore, the being picked up. By the time you get to five or six months, the responses are almost breaking up. I would expect it to be much clearer and simpler with age. Actually, it was much more variable. They couldn't be bothered sometimes, right? With the younger ones, it was much, much simpler and clearer. And what's happening, I think the minimum that you can say there is that these infants are aware that that mum is going to pick me up. Not that something is going to happen. They're looking at the face almost all of the time during the approach, that this person is going to pick me up. That's all. I mean, I don't want to claim conceptual awareness of intentionality at all. So if I can just conclude... So the awareness of mind in both of these cases of attentionality and intentionality, I think, emerges in emotional responses, in the broadest sense of the term emotional responses, to minds directed to the self. You don't get people addressing you with their attention, their intentional actions. You've got a bit of a problem in gaining the right experiences. With a gradual expansion scope and meaning rather than a discovery at some point in time, that these understandings are object and action specific rather than general and conceptual, that infants get an enormous amount of practice in these engagements. Um, I wanted to bring in the idea of culture here, um, partly, partly kind of to counter um, 
uh, assumptions that understanding mind is, it does vary. Awareness of mind does vary across culture, but partly to come to the assumption that understanding mind is like reading, learning a particular cultural language of minds. Yes, you kind of have to, but you don't learn it in an arbitrary fashion. You learn it, if you like, through your practice, through experiencing your emotional reactions and other people's actions towards you. So culture is being constituted in development all the time and being changed in development all the time. It's just a bit of a bugbear uh, for me and it's kind of an aside for this particular talk. talk. But um, it's also interesting though, this idea, the similarity between culture and mind, because if, you, if any of you are familiar with the old, um, I think it was Geertz, who talked about how can you ever get inside, how can you ever understand a culture without getting inside the native skin? The kind of opacity of culture that was assumed by some um, is also exactly the kind of opacity about mind that is assumed by most psychologists today. That how do you ever get to know somebody else's mind without getting inside their body? And I think. I won't go into it, I have written about this somewhere else, but the, the, both the problem of cult, perceived opacity of culture and perceived opacity of mind, and the resolutions to them, I, the resolutions are through involvement. The only way in which you understand culture, only way in which you understand mind is through getting involved. Not because getting involved opens a window and you can see it, but because through getting involved you are constituting the very thing that you're supposed to be understanding. Okay, and I stop there. That's a very, very, very interesting, elaborate exposition of, the, of, of facts which we only come to understand after they've been explained to us, even though they're straightforward and in front of us every day. It's amazing. So, um, questions now. I think we have half an hour, um, uh, and Ray is already on the board. So. <coughs> Thank you for a wonderful talk. It was really, thank you for a wonderful talk. It's really a trip down memory lane. I can remember the struggle with the triad of the baby the feces and the nappy, which was absolutely... And it, it, you just captured things which, as Roger was saying, one had seen every day, but actually had not really observed. Mm. But one of the things that really struck me and I loved about your talk was the way babies subvert things. Mm. I mean, mm. you know, Aristotle said man is a rational animal, but I think man is much more importantly a piss-taking animal. Because, <laughs> it, 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 in a sense, we have such a strong sense of norms, which are utterly unique in us, that subverting the norms is mm. something that comes in pretty early. Mm. Just like in language, I mean, children acquire language and acquire messing about with language mm. roughly mm. the same. And whereas the young of many uh, animals play, I think uniquely human, human young mess about. And I just wonder, I, I, it really resonates with me. I'm just thinking one final point, is you know, that Hazlitt said that um, the human body is the only object in the universe that laughs at the rest of the universe. You know, that we are the only creatures who can see the difference of how things are and how they ought to be. And that sense, strong sense of norms seems to me to come very beautifully through some of your videos. Norms to be subverted. Sorry, that was a bit long, but you get my drift. Yeah. I do. I mean, I'm not... I'm not so, I, I mean, it's an argument I've had with a lot of people before, but I'm not so keen to think that humans are the only animals which would, which would subvert. I don't know. I mean, you've got this... You've got isolated anecdotes of, well, certainly, uh, certainly amongst the apes of play and tricking. And you've got, decep you've got deception, which is not, is, you've got deception of, at a very simple level, a simple kind of deception. You know, things like, I wait until you're out of the room before I touch the oven, okay? Or, I wait, or, or eat the cheese plant, which is a more common thing. <laughs> than touching the other. That's one kind of obscurity. You, you get that kind of concealment in apes, but okay, this is adult apes, not and baboons. You get also more complex deceptions in infants, which are really, and you get them in adult monkeys and apes as well. So I'm not so sure about the subverting is primarily human, but, I don't, but I, I, I'm not so sure that matters in a sense. Thank you, Annie. The one interest, the reason I got interested in teasing and started studying it is because I thought I was interested in uh, pretending. Pretending doesn't happen until about 18 months. But the way we study pretending 
is um, I'm going to pretend that this is a glass of wine. Okay? I change the identity of the object. Right? Okay? I think I know this is a glass of water. I pretend that X. You, you, you basically, you muck about with object identities or existence and so on and so forth. But what's happening in the teasing is they're mucking about with the meaning, not of objects, but of actions. And it's happening nine months earlier. So I thought, oh, Vygotsky, interpersonal plane, a lot earlier than the object plane, and so on and so forth. But, uh, but it is true. It is a kind of pretending in a way, depending how you think about it. Any, any more questions? And there must be some, surely. Uh, yes, Jerry. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. Uh, really inspired by that. I have one question um, concerning the, um, let's say, the affordances created by the social environment. So you probably know about Gibson's uh, ecological perception theory, and um, maybe it's a kind of approach to talk about a social affordances in the perceptual yeah. system as well. So it has to start somewhere. So before we understand that we are both humans, same species, and the other knows we are same species, we respond to some kind of physical input, primarily, some kind of vectors in the behaviors of others, somehow announcing a collision, or somehow announcing a take up, which is very physical from, from potentially, I don't know. So it creates a kind of affordance, and like in the gypsum um, uh, theory, we say, okay, we see a hammer, but we don't see a hammer. We see something, we can put a nail into the wall. So this kind of affordance is yeah. created then and exemplified by experience. So you could probably imagine the same stuff sure. happening with human beings. So I, I, I learn what I can do about the object mother by... Uh, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, Ab right. You're absolutely okay. right. Social affordances are, are, are completely central. But I think there is a big danger in going down that road. And the danger is that you... F this is the kind of starting point and thing that I should have emphasized at the, big in, at, at the end. The danger is that you forget that this object mother is also an, a being mother who has, who evokes emotional reactions in you, which are absolutely primary. So it's not just that you're seeing the potential for action in an object, you're actually, you, you actually feel a response, okay? And that has got, and, and you know, you feel different responses depending on what kind of object mother does, what the object mother does to you. But, so that's kind of very, very crucial. Yeah. I, I, I absolutely accept that. The question is, is the reciprocity the primary, primary experience or is it the handling? So I, I, I'm the concerned about it. Resting the social object and making the experience of reciprocity and behavior uh, could be the, the temporal series. Here. So you handle this object, you try something out, and then you see that there's a reciprocation. And then uh, the right. feeling right. grows that you both at the same time species and the other is knowing that you know and all these kinds of things evolving and emerging all of a sudden and then going flowing up the system. Yeah. So I don't know. So you, I mean, you basically, by reciprocity, you mean if you do things and other people no, don't right. respond to you, yeah. then it doesn't go anywhere. Whereas yeah. when there is response, it explodes. Yep, I mean, it's like dialogue, isn't it? Yeah. It's like late night conversations where you don't quite know where it's going to go, but they, they often take you places. Oh, <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> well done for a man. <laughs> All of the engagements that you talked about were human-human engagements, but I know there's a trend, at least among some groups of parents, to set their infants in front of computers or hand them the iPad mm -hmm. or something. Can you say anything about uh, whether uh, infants really are engaging the technology or whether Parents are fooling themselves with this. Oh, I have no doubt that infants, I don't see why they shouldn't be engaging with them. I mean, they play with toys. They get engaged. If by engaged, it's my interest in understanding the workings of a toy that squeaks when I do this, etc. But the kinds of response that you get from the toy and from the computer only go so far, I think. You know? So I, I, I don't have a problem with, it, with people engaging with things immaterial. So you've you got your boobers tree anyway. So. That, does that, does that on, no, okay. The, uh, um. Hi there, Sarah. I wonder if you could just tell me with a, a source of some perplexity to me. Um, 
which is this. During the autism, there's some pretty good evidence that, crudely speaking, they're relatively good at reading goal-directed actions, what a person's intending to do, and relatively fragile, or, or have limitations, in reading attitudes as bodily expressed. Mm. But it's also the case that one of the classic observations, which I think pretty well everyone in the field accepts, is that they don't show anticipatory lifting of their arms to be picked up. Now, you situated your account of the, in, the typically developing infant's uh, mm. anticipatory gestures to that infant reading intentional actions, that they read intentional actions towards themselves in advance. And I just wonder about that place of putting it. Mm. And I, I was trying to explore this. That is to say, and you also mentioned, look, they look at the person's face. And I think there is something about this that probably uh, is particular to the, in, the kind of engagement with the other, which may be a bit differently characterized if one assimilates that to the kind of thing I was saying about a two-month-old making bids for engagement mm. with the other, all right? So it's not quite reading the intentions to action, but it's uh, experiencing the anticipation of an engagement in which I pay a, play a particular role. A systemic going on that the mothers are going to be picking me up, like there was a systemic going on about mother-infant in play, which I can indeed anticipate and do so. And I'm just not clear how centrally that relates to the developmental story about reading of intentions. I think it may do, but I think I what, like your okay. observations. So two off the top of my head thoughts. Um, one is that to have a system which works uh, in, terms of under, in terms of awareness of blah, 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 doesn't necessarily preclude that this is intentional action that I'm getting. It really doesn't. In fact, so the, the thought that I would have is maybe it's because I am aware that you are coming to get me. I'm not thinking intention, but I'm getting, if you like, you are going to pick me up, okay? It's because I am involved in it because of the systemic involvement that I then start, intentional actions start becoming clearer. And it's my response to want to be picked up. I mean, it's interesting. What would happen if the, I mean, we did, we actually, there's a lot, really a lot of, what happens if infants really don't want to be picked up? They don't automatically do it. They just don't bother. They just resist. If they're desperate to be picked up, they don't go through all this nice, nice arm lifting, leg lifting stuff. They're kind of just still thrashing around saying, get me out of here. So there, there are kinds of differences going on there. But, so one, th one argument is the system doesn't preclude aware calling it awareness of intentional action at some levels, and maybe that is precisely the joint action that is necessary for further understanding of intentions. The, the autism thing is interesting. I mean, actually, I, I, the, that kind of quote in 43, that children with autism, are re the parents report that they don't make answers. This is the children, not, not babies. Okay, there is no problem with learning and association in autism. What, what exactly, I mean, I don't know. I would leave it actually to, for further dis, for discussion with you or discussion at another point. So what exactly is the problem? Is it just a motor planning problem? A preparation problem? Is it a motivation problem? Or what that is actually preventing them from making these adjustments? So. More questions? I, I don't know. I think has a question. So I enjoyed your talk a lot too. And I wondered if you could just say a little bit more about something that was evident in your videos, but that wasn't so much the subject of your discussion, and it's this, the uh, infants show great pleasure mm. in the interaction. So it's not just a question of uh, their understanding and tension and so on, but somehow what you can see very evident and what you showed us, and of course what we all know otherwise anyway, it, is that infants find pleasurable second personal connection of one sort or another. And I wonder if you could say something about the relationship between the pleasure and the understanding and say something about autism in that connection. I mean, because it seems, as if, it seems as if in autism, part of what's going on is that the pleasure is missing. Yeah, okay, I'm nervous to speak about autism in front of 
an august audience, but I don't know, I wouldn't say that the pl in the children that we've seen, this is preschoolers that we did this study with, there were, there were several occasions of face-to-face uh, -face engagement, right? Just kind of holding and kind of being together. It was, it was not normal in the sense that it didn't go the routes that it didn't develop in the course of the interaction into other things. We also got a lot of um, rough and tumble play, which if I did not know this child was autistic, I could not have told because it looked completely normal. There was a getting back of the hands, there was looking at the face, there was enjoying, there was smiling with mutual gaze and everything. So I couldn't say that there is no pleasure in engagement, in, in, in individual engagement in autism. I wouldn't say that. I mean, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not the expert. I wouldn't say that. Um, whether pleasure plays a big role in further understanding... Okay. I think pleasure const is part of the understanding. So one of the things that I find, found myself doing wrong was, in a sense, focusing so much on the positive shyness, on the coyness, on the nice interactions of, of infants' responses to other people's attention to them, that I was kind of forgetting what happens when somebody glowers at them. I mean, you don't get it in our data because you get all these nice mothers who volunteer and therefore you're going to get them doing nice things. But what happens if it is the case that infants get something about the, the whole emotional package of the other's orienting towards them in a particular sort of way. And they get these responses, these pleased, involved, engaged, come back to me, I want more kind of responses. Apart from the still face study, which is horrible, what happens in the normal course of things when people get angry with them? And you know, parents do, even with very young babies. What, what's, how, what, how is the infant's understanding of what attentionality or intentionality means Developing, And the answer is that, that I think that both the infant's response to what the other person's doing and the kind of expression on the other person's face or voice has got to come together to constitute what the infants understand of this is what attention means, to put it very crudely. So I think it should really be constitutive. So the feelings that you get in response to someone's mind um, are, and that someone's expressions in response to you and so on and so forth are the stuff that makes up your understanding. Uh, yes. Can I just make an observation there? Because I, I think um, there is a, distinct, a, a distinction, obviously, between recognizing an action as intentional and recognizing the intention with which it is done. Um, I wonder whether that that re indicates some barrier that the child must cross? I mean, the child can see that perhaps that when I move my hand like that, it, that, that, that's an intentional movement. But the idea of there being a goal, as it were, independent of that movement mm. that I'm trying to achieve, mm. perhaps might be a more sophisticated Well, uh, except thing. that when, with the Amanda Woodward studies, mm. um, when you show five-month-olds, I mean, you can train three-month-olds to do it, when you show five-month-olds these arms reaching out... Yes, that was a good... Interesting experiment, that. Good. Um, I guess it could be interpreted as having that, making that distinction. Uh, because the action seems kind of similar. Yeah, yeah because, exactly. Mm -hmm. so, and the goal is independently identifiable. Yeah. Uh, another question like that. Could you just say a little more about the child's developing, in, the infant's developing interest in hands? Uh, oh. Which comes, I, I gather, late, well, but later than I expected. Uh, you, you, uh, many of the intrusive things that happen to children happen by hands. By hands. Um, and, uh, and, and yet it is interesting that the hands are not what they're looking at. Yes. They're looking at the person. That's right. Have you any thoughts about why that should be the case? I mean, Given I, that you need hands to do everything, as I think Max Bygrave said. Okay, I mean, one interpretation could be that what the infants are getting is this whole person. They aren't breaking the, in, they aren't breaking the person down into, oh, those hands are coming at me again with that needle, right? Until such a point when hands start to become clear. The, the, the things that hands do start to become clear. 
Um, it isn't until somewhere around three or four months that they themselves start reaching, proper reaching, not the pre-reaching that you do get in neonates that we don't understand enough of in any case. Um, their interest in the mother's hand seems to be accompanying, coming somewhere around that age. There's one really nice study by um, a Japanese team, uh, Amano and, uh, and others, where they looked at the social affordances, the affordances of looking at mother, the, other, the adult's hands. So as long as the mother was there engaging with them, the infant looked at the mother's face. It's when the mother was there and then turned away and you got the profile, the chances that the gaze, to the, the gaze then went to the mother's hands. If the hands then did something interesting, you could then understand that this is a whole very simple <coughs> situational thing which is drawing the in, infant's intention, attention to something that could then turn out to be significant. And if it turns out to be significant, the infants understand it more and more and so on. So on the one hand, I would say that the hands the hands are a tool in a way. The hands aren't the person. So the interest in the hands comes later, a lot more or less alongside their own hand explorations of the world, reaching and grasping. There is a, a, a point to, to be made there as well, which has been made by the world's expert on the moral nature of the hand, um, Ray Tallis, which is that actually the hand is fundamental to our understanding of the other as a person. Or, or there is no great portrait painter that hasn't, who hasn't been as good at painting hands as mm. faces. Mm. Uh, and um, if you, uh, who was it? Who, somebody this today talking about who put uh, it's the lady at the back who's now forgotten, um, the Austrian lady. Um, yes, uh, but yes. Showed us Rembrandt's famous picture in the Hermitage of the, um, of the return of the prodigal son, in which all the expression is in the hands mm. on the shoulders mm. of the son. Mm. You know, that is very much a, 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 a second personal observation. You know, this is the, the, the hand that, uh, that consoles me and so on. I think that, obviously, it's important to recognize that the hand and the face are competitors for attention always. In, in personal relations. And just bouncing back on that, Roger, I may, it seems like Aristotle famously described the hand as the tool of tools. It mm. was the, in a sense, it was the er agent. Because your hand is both separate from yourself and inseparable from you. And it is our first tool. And, and, yep. and there are special properties of the human hand which are not matched in other primate hands. And so the discovery of the hand is very much the discovery of oneself as an embodied agent. And, and there's a beautiful uh, passage in uh, one of Anthony Burgess's novels in which he looks at two twins sitting on someone's lap. They're about three to four months, staring at their own hands like drunks. You know, they're absolutely obsessed by these strange objects. And, and of course, Kant made a lot of it as well. But you do get... Uh, no, that's really interesting, but it's just reminded me of something. Like, even earlier than three... Or, before infants begin reaching and grasping, you do get the occasion... Like, you put them in front of a mirror you do get them interested, not just in the hand, not in the hand as a tool, because they haven't started using it as a tool yet, but in the hand as a moving part of me. And you do get these kind of explanations. And if you look at one month old, Audrey van der Meer has done this study, and again, this was done in Edinburgh, but um, she's now in Norway. One month old, if you focus a camera on their, um, they're lying on their backs, you focus a camera either from this side or from this side, on this hand or from that hand, you show them a monitor, counterbalance this side or that side. Whichever monitor is showing whichever hand, no, whichever hand the monitor is showing moving will move more, okay? Even if they hang weights, as psychologists cruelly are apt to do to make life very difficult for infants, on the hand that is moving, despite that extra effort that's needed, they'll move it more. So there's something, before you can reach and grasp, the hand, before the hand is a tool, the hand is also a part of your body which moves as a part of you, but not, a, not you. Yeah, so, so that's true. Hmm. And that's at one month, four weeks or something, all right. Uh, I have another question from Eleanor at the, uh, the back. Uh, and I think we might, um, unless there's somebody urgently wanting to speak, we might call I just have a quick follow-up question on this issue of hands. As I'm sure you know, 
there is a rage in the US and in parts of Europe for teaching infants uh, sign language. Yeah. And I wonder what you think about that. What, what does that change in infant development, if anything? What are the impacts of it? What do we learn from this? Um, I, do, I mean, I haven't got an um, informed answer to it. My, uh, I, I know that you teach infant sign language, they communicate more complexly earlier. My impulse would be to say, well, if you've got better communication earlier, then great. Because what you've got when you've got communication either face to face or about things, if it is genuine, if it, is, if it isn't kind of some kind of a forced pressure, drought learning performance, um, is, is just enriching the dialogue, right? If, if you and I talk more about more things, we can go, we can develop it further. I have never seen it. in the infant are a function of what the, you might say, what the machinery can do for the yeah. infant. So that maybe there would be a, a worry about going from things like infant patterns of responsiveness of a certain sort to something about infant's understanding of things if in fact it, it's just the clumsiness of the bodily machinery that gets in the way of their expressing something. I mean, if infants can talk with their hands before they can talk with their mouths, then the idea that somehow language develops at this stage, because that's all we hear in the, in the stuff coming from the mouth, that would be a worrisome infant. So that's all I was asking. I, see, I, I don't, why, I, I'm not so sure why that sh should ne necessarily worry us. There is an enormous variability in what comes first in language in, in, across infants, right? And it doesn't, we, at least we don't know if it does, if those things have caused patterns that we aren't aware of them. And if you look probably at infants, at 12 month olds now using laptops and iPads versus 12 month olds 50 years ago, um, they're, they're certainly able to do more. I mean, there's this amazing YouTube picture of a child doing that with an iPad. You know, you, I, don't, I don't have Mac things. And you're supposed to, it does things when you do that? Or, okay. Um, and then the, sh the then she puts the iPad aside and picks up a magazine and she keeps doing that and it's like, <laughs> and it's just it's just amazing. So what? So yes, it's changed the nature of her engagement with the world and with us about the world. It's changed the extent to which she can control the world or engage with different functions with of things. I mean. But I bet, I bet that's just a continuing process. Just, I, that gave me a thought about sign language, actually. That if Ray is right, that the hand is the, the tool of tools, that it's the primary way of understanding it is as a tool, namely something engaged in doing something else. When, you, when, it, when the infant is confronted with, with it doing refer, only itself, so to speak, so he has to concentrate on the hand without it being used for any other purpose. Perhaps that is a, a quick way of getting to the idea that the person doing this is wanting the child to recognize his intention. You know, so that, I mean, there are theories of meaning well known to philosophers which say that meaning is primarily, re the, uh, comes into existence when, through, with the intention that the other recognise the in your intention. Mm. You do mm. something with mm. a particular intention, namely that this intention itself should be recognised. Yeah, and perhaps uh, uh, the abstraction of the hand from the business of doing things makes it more likely to be a vehicle of projecting that idea. I don't know. Right, that would explain perhaps why sign language could be more early, earlier than, than other forms of language. I don't know. Or it could be a simpler um, articulation function. Yes. Anyway, it's um, going in another direction. So if there are no more questions, uh, and it being six o'clock, thank you very much uh, for a <laughs>